Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Today is February 19th, 2022. I'm Steve Shields, president of Royal Asiatic Society of Korea. I welcome you to our lecture on behalf of the officers and council. Please remember, lecture content does not necessarily reflect the opinions or positions of Royal Asiatic Society of Korea. The Royal Asiatic Society traces its beginnings to India in the late 1700s and was formally chartered in London in 1824 by King George IV. The Royal Asiatic Society of Great Britain and Ireland granted a charter to the Korea branch in 1900, the fourth year of the reign of the Kwangmu Emperor of Korea, who is more commonly known as King Gojong. His Majesty was a dear friend of RAS Korea and its members. RAS Korea expresses sincere thanks to our generous sponsor, Asia Development Foundation, for their fourth year of support. We also thank our members who have paid their annual dues. Your dues provide essential funding for RAS Korea, without which uh, we couldn't host our lecture series. For 122 years, we have strived to explore and promote all facets of Korea's rich heritage. Members receive our annual journal, Transactions. Members are also recognized reciprocally by Asia's RAS-affiliated societies, as well as the London-based original RAS. We would love to have you join us if you're not already a member. Membership gives you the opportunity to support the world's first and oldest Korean studies organization. I will post a link in the chat box once we get going. Uh, if you're not a member, please buy a quote ticket unquote for tonight's lecture. Refer to the donation page on the screen. And also, well, we'll put that information in the chat box later. We are joined tonight from California by William Yu. William is a Korean American screenwriter and an Asian American advocate. Uh, Yu's original TV half hour comedy pilot, Good Boy, was selected for the 2020 Sundance Episode Makers Lab and was named to the 2020 CAPE list as a top screenplay by an AAPI, AAPI writer. William's feature romantic comedy, It Was You, was recently selected to the blacklist, the buzzy compendium of the year's most liked unproduced Hollywood screenplays, and also uh, uh, attracted, uh, oh dear, I've messed up my script. Uh, it attracted the uh, crazy rich Asian director, John Chu. Uh, William is the creator of Starring John Cho, the viral project used uh, Photoshop movie posters to spark a global conversation about Asian American representation in media and had a wide ranging impact. William brings a global perspective with family roots stretching as far as Seoul and Jamaica. He was born in Philadelphia, raised in Hong Kong, seasoned in New York and resides in Los Angeles. After the lecture, there will be time for questions. Let's please welcome William Yu. Well, William, we're glad to have you with us. And uh, I'll stop my share and you'll be able to share your screen. Please go ahead sure. and uh, take the, the stage as it were. All right, let's do it. Let's see if this works as well as I think it will. There we go. Yeah, All right, does that look like it's going somewhere? It's cool. There we are. Yep, we're all here. Right. All right, I'm going to turn off my mic, uh, ask all the others to mute their mics as well. And uh, we're excited to hear what you have to say for us. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for uh, attending and, and taking the time out of the day to, to get up on, I guess, your morning time, my evening time, uh, to chat about something that I love chatting about, which is movies and entertainment and Asian and Asian American representation. Um, so today we're going to talk uh, the, the name of this topic and this talk is called The Rise of the New Asian American. Um, but, you know, we'll talk about a little bit about a project that I started called Hashtag Starring John Cho, which was a side project that became much bigger than I ever thought it could be and which sparked a, a global conversation about Asian American representation, um, where the culture currently stands and where I think I hope it will go. 
Um, so hopefully for anyone interested in those subjects, so this will be fun for you. Um, first off, uh, just hi, uh, I'm William. Uh, these are some links you can, you can find me at if you ever want to talk or drop me a line or a message. Um, I'm, as, as in the bio uh, stated, I'm a screenwriter out here in LA uh, who used to work in advertising, had a career working five years in New York in advertising and recently made, or a few years ago, made the pivot to writing, writing scripts full time, both in TV and film, um, and has now kind of made it my mission to bring more Asian and Asian American stories into this industry. Um, so if you're interested in talking and furthering this conversation, please find me at any of these um, uh, uh, points and I'd, I'd be happy, I'd love to talk with you some more. Um, so first off, I think, you know, I, I kind of wanted to start this conversation in talking about some of the movies and pieces of entertainment that I love and have always grown up watching. And, you know, I think in the last few years, some of the highlights of films that I've really enjoyed seeing are movies like Whiplash. Uh, maybe you've seen some of these movies, maybe you haven't, but you've got a movie like Whiplash, which is about a, uh, an aspiring, ambitious jazz drummer who wants to be one of the greats and will do whatever it takes to get there. Um, there's a movie I love called Brooklyn, which is about an Irish immigrant who comes to New York in search of hope and love and has to deal with different family stripes in order to find herself. Um, and then you have a movie like Midsummer, which is a horror movie that, you know, pushes the boundaries of what fear can look like and what scary times can look like and what psychological thrillers can look like. And it's set in, in Norway in this very Nordic culture and really tests and, and, and hits all these different emotions of, of what can really drive fear in everyone. Um, but I think growing up, you know, a reason why I bring these three stories up is that oftentimes when I think about them, I'm not really thinking about them in terms of who's starring in it or what the lead actor or lead actress looks like. I'm thinking in terms of story of character, of who these people are, the values that they represent and what, how I relate to that as an audience member. And it just so happens that oftentimes when I do this, when I'm watching Hollywood films, I'm watching films that feature people that don't look like me uh, or come from similar backgrounds who haven't had families that have grown up in Korea or grown up in Asia or grown up in anywhere other than the States. And I think to that, there's always been an interesting gap of, of how I can re fully relate to these types of characters. And I think that's always really weighed really heavy, heavily on me. And I, and, I, and I never really knew how I felt about it until about a few years ago, um, in about 2014, um, Sony was hacked uh, in this massive hack that released a lot of information from across the Hollywood industry. And one of the big items that rang out to me was this quote from Oscar winning screenwriter, Aaron Sorkin, who wrote The Social Network um, and wrote uh, Being with the Ricardos, which just came out recently. And Aaron Sorkin was talking about a book called Flash Boys that he was trying to adapt, uh, which featured a, a Japanese American lead. And he was describing the difficulties of making this project because he was very adamant that there aren't any Asian movie stars. And that was a big barrier for him to make this movie made. And I remember when this quote came out feeling really unsettled by it and feeling very a little angry by it because I think in, my hopes and my heart of hearts, I had to believe that there were people out there in the world that were of Asian descent, that were people that Hollywood could look at and say, this is someone that I want to lead my movie. Um, and yet it just didn't really seem to line up. You know, there weren't very many uh, people growing up that I could look at who represented you know, my culture in that same way. And then shortly, uh, a, year, year, a few years later in 2016, uh, at the Academy Awards, um, Chris Rock, who was hosting, trotted out three little Asian children and made a joke talking about how these three little Asian kids were PricewaterhouseCoopers most dedicated, accurate and hardworking representatives. And the entire theater laughed at this joke, at this idea of little three little Asian kids just being really diligent hard workers who are probably really good at math and can crunch numbers in a way where uh, they can tally up all the Oscar votes. And I think this is where I started to kind of find my breaking point of where of realizing the ways in which American culture, my country's culture, saw people who looked like me and was as a stereotype, as the butt of the joke, as someone to be marginalized and someone to be made fun of. And that was not, not a great feeling. And so I think I was wondering, you know, what do you do with all this 
with, with the way that this world is seeing you when you don't feel that it aligns with your reality. And it wasn't really until I came upon the study that came out of the UCLA Bunch Center um, where they do a report annually called the Hollywood Diversity Report. And they analyze all the box office statistics of the top 100 movies that have come out that year. And one of the findings that they had found was that film and television content that is more diverse tends to be more successful, both among white and minority audiences and delivers a better financial return on investment. So if you think about movies like Coco or Girls Trip or Fast and Furious, which have like relatively diverse film or the casts, um, they actually do really, really great at the box office. Um, you know, there are other films like Blade Runner or The Great Wall, which was starring Matt Damon or Extraction or, or, or movies that, um, that aren't as diverse uh, that actually do worse at the box office. And yet, if it seems to be that if diverse casts are more successful, then why don't we see that level of diversity reflected in the real, in the lead roles? Why don't we see if it's Fast and Furious, you know, we have a diverse cast, but it's never quite the people at front and center of the movie poster that is the person that comes from a different community, a different background. And that kind of got the wheel turning for me a little bit about how um, we see ourselves and how Hollywood sees people from these different communities. And if the number and the data, numbers and the data tell us that, you know, we actually are, are the, where the money is, then shouldn't we see that then reflected in the people that are at the front and center of, of these properties? And so what's interesting is that instead of seeing that over the past few years, we've seen people like Chris Evans, who is plays Captain America, you know, a hero that represents bravery and courage. We've seen people like Chris Hemsworth, who plays Thor in the Marvel movies, who is, you know, bravado and brash and strong. And you have someone like Chris Pine, you know, who plays in Wonder Woman, uh, he plays Steve Trevor and plays, you know, a sensitive leading man who is there to support uh, Wonder Woman. And then you have someone like Chris Pratt, who is in the Guardians of the Galaxy, who plays, you know, a sarcastic, smart mouth a-hole who is also very much, you know, invested in being the hero and saving the day. And it's very clear that there's a common through line other than these guys all being named Chris. Um, you know, they all have a certain feature of ethnicity. And it's very clear that Hollywood is interested in and invested in uplifting these types of individuals for their lead roles. And surely I think if I know that, you know, if more diverse casts are better returns on investment, why are we seeing the same tried and true rollout of these lead leading men happen again and again in Hollywood? And that's something that what I found really frustrating, given that Hollywood has a very long history of putting people, especially of Asian descent, to the side and in the corner, and specifically in ways that when we see in these films that you see on the screen in front of you are encapsulated by the practice of whitewashing, um, which if, if you're not familiar is the practice of placing eight white actors uh, into Asian roles and either physically manipulating them to look more Asian, like you have like Mickey Rooney in Breakfast at Tiffany's, uh, which is now largely regarded as a very racist caricature of a Japanese man living in America, uh, all the way up to someone like Jim Sturgis, who's in the bottom right middle of your screen, who played um, a whitewashed version of Jeff Ma, who was part of the notorious MIT Blackjack uh, card counting group in Vegas some years ago, uh, all the way to more recently. And if you see in movies like The Social Network, uh, where Divya Namendra is played by a, a European man um, versus a South Asian man in real life. And so we see time and time again in, the, in these films that Hollywood has no problem putting even someone like John Wayne to play Genghis Khan. And as ridiculous as that might sound to us today, that was very much in vogue in style and was commonly accepted that this is what you do when you have a quote unquote Asian story that you wanna portray in this industry. And it's not just something, as much as I, I would love to think that this is something in the past, this is actually a practice that still continues today. And I think one of the reasons in 2016, that was the start of me wondering, what can I do about it? What can I? do to create to push back against this. And 2016 was kind of a banner year. There was a slew of different casting announcements, one of which on your left, you see a character who is known as the Ancient One, uh, which is a Tibetan character in the movie, in the, in the comic book franchise, Doctor Strange. And that year when it was announced that they were making a Doctor Strange movie, they also announced that Tilda Swinton would be playing a, a version of, of the Ancient One. 
Um, so testing a very, very white actor as, as this like Tibetan Asian character. Um, and then all the way up to a few years ago, there was a character of uh, Sergeant Ben, Sergeant Ben from uh, the Hellboy franchise when they were rebooting it. And they announced that they had cast a British actor Ed Scrine in it to play that role. And then also in, in, in another film, another property in which they were whitewashing was in the Ghost in the Shell franchise where they take Major Motoko Kusanagi and cast uh, Scarlett Johansson in that role. So clearly this is still something that exists today. This is still something that Hollywood uh, studios continue to do. Um, and at that point in 2016, five some years ago, um, I, saw, I kept seeing this happen and was starting to get more and more frustrated with what was going on. And starting to realize that every time that I would talk about why there were no Asian leads in Hollywood, why there was, wasn't better represent, representation in Hollywood for Asian communities, the conversation would always kind of top out in the theoretical. It always kind of ended in the same way that Aaron Sorkin would say, there aren't any Asian movie stars that, oh man, you know, I just don't know who would be that person. There aren't so many people. Crazy Rich Asians hadn't come out yet. The Walking Dead wasn't huge yet. Minari hadn't come out yet. Parasite hadn't hit yet. And so the actors that we actually think about today, like Henry Golding and Stephen Yun, they weren't at the level where they could kind of be there. And so I started to think a little bit harder and harder about what I could do because I was getting frustrated of having this very, you know, loose conversation. I was like, let's, I need to put some, something into action, something into motion. And so that initially looked like this. Uh, this is a real picture that I took uh, in New York where I used to live. And what I did is I went into the New York City subway at 2 a.m. I had printed a sticker of actor John Cho's face out onto, uh, onto some uh, uh, out and I had posted hashtag starring John Cho and I slapped it on a, uh, a subway ad. And I was like, maybe this is something that will like jar people out of their daily commute and maybe they'll think it's funny or weird or, or talk about it. Um, and basically I thought that was gonna be a really awesome uh, invigorating thing. Turns out nothing happened after this. Uh, and I had to go back to the drawing board and think about, okay, how do I get my point across that, you know, there should be more Asian representation in Hollywood. Um, and so I thought about this a little bit harder. I thought about, you know, if there are 21 million uh, people of Asian descent in, in America, and we are actually uh, at 3.4%, which is the rate of Asian American population growth, we are actually the fastest growing ethnic group uh, in America right now. We outpace everybody else. And we also uh, have our buying power, which is projected to grow to 1.3 trillion in 2023. So I started to put these ideas together that we're a growing group. We are someone that has growing buying power, growing economic financial influence in this country. Why shouldn't we see ourselves better represented in the, the media that we consume? And so what I also kind of contrasted that against was the fact that while there were so while we represent 6% of the Asian American population, when you look at Hollywood and when you look at the UCLA Bund study and when you look at the different groups and ways in which we are represented in media, only 1% of lead roles in Hollywood go to Asian actors. And that's not even Asian American actors, it's just actors of Asian descent. So there still is this, this disparity, this gap of, of how we are seen, especially in lead roles as, as the main focus of these stories. And so I thought about how I wanted to kind of tackle this problem and how to address it. When I tried to go into the subway and put a sticker on something, it didn't work. I needed to think a little bit harder about it. And I thought about these two different groups of people that I, I wanted to talk to. And the first one is uh, on the left, which is my sister, Sam. And Sam is someone who I talk to all day, every day about this issue. I, she's sick of it. I, she knows the issue, she knows the problems. But most of all, I think Sam empathizes because she knows why representation matters. And she understands the lengths that representation can push you to dream bigger and dream more. And uh, this is a quote from Judith Kellner, who's an NYU adjunct professor, who talks about how representation matters because it makes us feel visible versus ignored. It makes us feel that we matter. It makes us feel that we're worthy. And it makes us feel that we have value. And I think that oftentimes when I talk about it or when people who look like me talk about it, we get that. We get that on a very easy, it connects immediately. But however, when we look at the other groups, um, like the one on the right, it takes a little bit more to get across to them. 
And there are myriad reasons why they need to be convinced. Sometimes it's they, they don't empathize. Sometimes they are unable to uh, imagine. And other times, you know, it can be financial, or at least so they say. And so this is Ridley Scott, who I circled. And a few years ago, he was trying to promote a movie that had um, was set in, in uh, Egypt. And he's talked about that. That was a whitewashed movie. And he talked about how he can't mount a film of, of a big budget and announce that my lead actor is Muhammad so-and-so from such and such. This is a real quote. And so clearly there is a inability to really believe and trust that someone outside their own community can be the first name top billing uh, in this type of setting. And I think that's something where it needs to be addressed. And there needs to be something that can convince them that, hey, this is something that we all need to talk about and take seriously, not just those who are invested in it. Um, one moment here. Oops, sorry, don't know what's going on. Um, one moment, I have to do order, please. Let's see. Okay, I think we're back. And so in, in making this project, uh, I kind of went to the drawing board and really thought about, okay, if we wanna create a project and prove that there are, there are people in the waiting for in Hollywood right now that are ready for that leading role or ready to take up the mantle and be the face of the next franchise, the next big thing, you know, who could that be? And this is what, this is what you see on your screen is what happens when you Google Asian American actors. And so what you'll see is that there, are seemingly a lot of faces, a lot of choices. You'll see some, you know, you'll see Randall Park, you'll see Daniel Day Kim. Uh, I think up there you see Ken Jeong, Steven Yun. And these are all people that I think, you know, are, are in the weeds of the industry right now. But in 2016, when I started this project, there really were few names that had the level of credibility that could necessarily say this should be the face of the next franchise. And so I decided upon a few different conditions. I was like, all right, I need to sort through all this. I need to find someone with a cult following, with leading man experience, with critical acclaim, and with box office success. You know, someone who can really prove that they can drive dollars as well. And so hopefully if we go through, we'll be able to find many, many different actors who check all those boxes. Because these are all the issues that oftentimes Hollywood throws back at you to say, this is why we can't cast this person. They don't sell tickets. No one knows who they are. You know, do they have experience? You know, are they, do they have the chops to carry a franchise? So I was like, if I can cross these out, then I think we'll have something. And so when you really look at this like large uh, pool of candidates, only unfortunately the, the, the kind of scary reality at that time was there really was only one person that checked all those boxes and that was John Cho. Um, it wasn't by accident that I chose him. It wasn't for fun. He actually was the only one who was seemingly qualified in, in this in this way, where he had a cult following from doing the Harold and Kumar movies. He had leading man experience as the central main uh, uh, role in a, in a franchise called Selfie, which was a TV show. And he had critical acclaim. He had movies like Columbus, uh, movies previously and all his other roles that he had also been uh, heralded, whether it was the MPPR or New York Times, he had been given lots of credibility by critics and he had box office success. Not only was Harold and Kumar a hundred million dollar franchise, uh, he had also been part of the Star Trek franchise and had done very well in, in garnering a lot of praise and driving a lot of ticket sales through that. So we went, eventually decided that, okay, going to the subway, slapping a sticker on a wall, you know, could only reach so many people. How do we make this? How do we reach more? And that's when I decided to use a little bit of my advertising experience and figure out how we could create something bigger. And that's what hashtag starring John Cho became. Um, it became a website. It became something where I was able to Photoshop uh, hit movie posters with John Cho's face on them and launched a website that had information about Asian representation, about why there needed to be more Asian leads in Hollywood and a Twitter account. And the Twitter account was there used to kind of send out all these movie posters. So that way users could see what it would look like if, if John Cho was in the Avengers playing Captain America, what it might look like in John Cho in playing in Me Before You, which was a very big rom-com hit. Um, and him playing opposite Amelia Clark and playing the romantic, the idealist. 
Or what it might look like if John Cho was in a movie like Five Inches of Summer, Five Days, Five Hundred Days of Summer. You know, trying to woo the, someone that he loves, trying to figure out how to make it, being the everyman, being imperfect, being flawed, and just trying to make it through like everyone else is trying to get it through, make it through. And I did more. I did movies like 21 about the MIT card counters. I made a, a poster about Spectre, like what if John Cho was James Bond? Uh, what if John Cho was in The Martian, which was, had Matt Damon in it? What if John Cho was uh, Ethan Hunt in the Mission Impossible franchise? And really, I think for me, the point of selecting all these movies were to pick movies that people knew about that were excited about to watch, but also that they would recognize that the main characters on these films weren't necessarily playing characters that are bound by their ethnicity or what they look like. They all represent different values. You know, Mission Impossible, you, you're a hero. You're putting your life on the line. You're trying to save the world. The card counters, they're ambitious young hustlers that are trying to make a buck. Um, these aren't things that are necessarily, you know, dictated by where you're born. I think we can all, we all know people that have this vast array of, of the human condition because we're all human beings and we all, you know, have our different hopes and dreams. And I think that was the point to try and get across. And what was great is that once the ball, ball started rolling, I was able to take this even further and bring it into the real world. Uh, in New York, there's a, a famous uh, storefront called Pearl River Mart, and we were able to create a art gallery using the John Cho posters where we printed them out. We invited the community in, they were able to interact with all these different posters. I created another project after hashtag starring John Cho, which used deep fake technology to uh, basically implant Asian faces onto uh, major film roles so you could see what a living, breathing Asian American movie star would look like. And what was amazing is that I actually even got to meet people like John Cho. And I think what was great is that when the project started to, uh, when I first launched it, it took on a life of its own and it spread like wildfire. And so when this project first started, you know, I thought that maybe a few friends would see it, some family members, uh, but then the internet, internet took hold of it. And so the New York Times uh, covered it, BBC covered it. I did a, uh, an, a live interview on CNN uh, about the project. Um, and it really, it really took off. And I think even doing as so far so global to the fact that there were newspapers in Hong Kong, in Germany, in Japan, my cousin who was doing a study abroad program in Spain saw it uh, on the subway and even before she knew it was me. And so clearly I think this just realigned everything that I ever thought about this conversation where I always thought it was just, you know, me and my friends talking the subject to death wondering why there wasn't an answer. And it turns out that the whole world had a similar question and was ready to talk about it. And so I think that for me was kind of something that, uh, at, that at that point in time, I honestly didn't really believe that this was possible. And to see the entire world take it and, and create their own starring John Cho posters, put different faces onto movies that they love because they also thought, why not? Why shouldn't something like this exist? And I think that's something that we've all seen over the last few years has only increased and started to become more prevalent uh, in Hollywood and in the entertainment industry um, around the world. And so I think, you know, what was really, really wonderful in reflecting about uh, this project was kind of discovering that there is this, new, what I believe that there is a new mindset and a new audience, particularly from uh, the Asian American community that I think is currently taking hold right now in the culture and what I've simply coined as the new uh, Asian American. And these, and I've picked five different people, Anna Kana, who is an actress who is talking and opening up about how she meets mental health head on and how she wants to destigmatize mental health in the Asian American community. You have people like Hassan Minhaj, who is talking about the truth in the immigrant story and finding laugh and love and hopes uh, and that are that challenge our, our preconceptions of what being an immigrant is. People like Chloe Kim, who are st athletic stars and proving that you can embrace both sides of your heritage in, in athletic excellence. Uh, directors like Justin Chan, who is exploring not just what it means to be a Korean American, but how that relationship intersects with other communities, with Black communities, with Latinx communities, um, and comedians like Ali Wong, who are redefining what feminism and motherhood look like for Asian American women, and how that is different from years and decades past. And these, I think a lot of these, what a lot, what's interesting a lot about a lot of these individuals is that they all kind of have three similar pillars that they that they sit on 
One is the, the audacity of equality, which is just believing that we have any as much right to be here as anybody else in this country. Uh, we have expectations of a culture that are rooted in filial piety and rooted in respecting our elders and ensuring our culture lives on, but also pushing back against those expectations and defining them for ourselves. And a, and a demand to be woven into the American fabric. I think that's something where we are redefining what it means to be American and owning the term Asian American in a way that feels a little bit different, a little bit broader, a little bit messier um, than it used to traditionally. And I think that's something where, it, that's why it feels like such an exciting time for Asian American culture um, in general, but also in Hollywood specifically. Because, and I think this leads to a bigger topic of how we are defining the term Asian American. Um, all the terms that you see on the screen right now are all the ways in which the Pew Research Center um, defines the term Asian American. And it's a lot, it's, it's a quite a vast range. And I think what the challenge over these next few years that we are continuing to find is how to embrace the nuance and the differences of all these different groups. Um, while most people, I think, would think of the term Asian American as just Chinese, Indian, Korean, Vietnamese, when you really break it down, you know, when you think about Sri Lankan, Malaysian, and Mongolian, those are all groups that exist in America that all have their different challenges. And so oftentimes when we think about um, certain stereotypes that the Asian American being this model minority who is doing well and who is able to thrive, um, that's also, it's contrasted against the fact that when you go into the Cambodian Hmong Thai communities, they are often one of the lowest income groups. And so clearly that is the entire breadth of the Asian American experience. And to say that one does or does not count uh, is erasing an entire group. And I think that's something that we are continuing to push against, continuing to dive deeper to show that um, there's a lot more to it when we talk about this general umbrella of what it means to be Asian American. And what's great is that not only when we think about projects like starring John Cho, which are centered around a Asian leading man, I think one of the cool offshoots of that was a, a project that someone else started and took into their own hands called starring Constance Wu, which was able to think about also not just what it is to be an Asian leading man, but also an Asian leading woman. And I think that's something that we continue to also find as we get deeper into this definition, because it's really not just about what it means for one group or one gender, but how we intersect with all these different communities. I wanted to also bring it back to, to um, this character right here um, that was in the Hellboy reboot that was initially cast Ed Skrein, a British actor, in to play a Japanese American character. Um, I bring it back up because oftentimes, I think when we talk about Asian American representation in Hollywood, we often think about how it rests on our community solely to bear the responsibility of moving upward or trying to claim more space in this very, very crowded industry. Um, but what's really interesting about this example is that Ed Skrein, when th there was a lot of backlash about this casting, he actually create, made a statement that says, it, it's clear that re representing this character in a culturally accurate way holds significance for people, and that to neglect this responsibility would continue a worrying tendency to obscure ethnic minority stories and voices in the arts. Therefore, I have decided to step down. And I think this was probably at that point one of the first of the bigger instances in which a non-Asian um, actor or someone who had that level of influence decided to step away. And I think that's something that we can't forget in this search for greater equality and greater representation, that it shouldn't just fall on us to carry the torch and carry the banner, but that this is something where we need allies. We need to think about other communities and how they also care about the way in which we are represented. And what was great is that this was a clear learning lesson in which Ed Scrum was able to step down and Daniel Day Kim was later cast in this role. And I think while we are still trying to figure out what the best way to represent Asian characters is, does it mean you only do Japanese actors play Japanese roles or Korean actors only play Korean roles? I think we're finding that this, uh, this at least in, the, in these early days of representation conversation is a productive step forward. And I think we should try to find ways in which uh, it's also not just the actor's responsibility to think about who gets to represent these roles, but the fact is that it shouldn't necessarily always end up becoming the actor's responsibility to take on or step away. These are, they have representatives, they have agents, they have managers, they have, there are studio executives, there are development executives, there are writers who all have say in some level 
of who gets to play these roles. And I think it does, shouldn't necessarily always come to the last point where we then have to worry about uh, the audiences trying to cause a stir, create backlash, but hopefully as more people in the system become more aware and empathetic to accurate representation, um, there's more conversations and we're able to catch these things before it gets to the point where someone has to step down for a role. Um, let's see, and I think one thing that is really exciting is that I wanna see if this clip will play for you. So let me see if we can do that. William, we're not getting any audio on this. Oh, okay. <clears throat> I, I don't know if it's because you've got headphones hooked up or what. I, 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 I'm kind of gotcha. techno dwarf. Okay, that's fine. I can, I can, I can just describe to you what the what the video was in that case. Um, so that that uh, the video that I was trying to play before uh, was an interview. Um, that John N. Chu, who was the director of Crazy Rich Asians, uh, and he was talking to John Cho. And in the interview, John N. Chu was talking about how one of the main reasons that he wanted to make a movie like Crazy Rich Asians was because of the starring John Cho movement. And because he saw people putting John Cho's face into all these different posters that clearly he realized himself a light turned on, where he had an ability to do something about it. And so from there, he decided to create uh, and direct Crazy Rich Asians, which, which became one of the biggest uh, rom-com movies uh, in the past decade to ever be released. And I think in, it, it's such a shocking and cool moment in, in ways in which we are able to see how social media and how audiences are able to ask and demand better representation in their films and also see that it can, those types of messages can reach people at the top, can reach and influence those that are able to make more uh, content and make more films and entertainment and media that they can affect that change as well. And it was it's been great to see over the past few years where we see movies like Crazy Rich Asians or movies like Searching or To All the Boys I've Loved Before or Always Be My Maybe or The Farewell um, be released and be released to big success and be released where they are the number one movies on in the box office or on Netflix or are nominated for Oscars, um, which to me, at least growing up, I felt this is very unprecedented. These are not films that I've grown up seeing given one even existing and two even really getting this kind of acclaim. And what I love about seeing this is also just the scale of all these different movies where you have a movie like The Farewell, which is a very, very small independent film or a movie like Crazy Rich Asians or even now movies like Shang-Chi, which are global worldwide phenomenons and showing that we can fit and tell stories across the spectrum of Hollywood and they can do well, they can be critically acclaimed and they can sell a lot of tickets as well. And that's something that I think is, makes such an exciting time uh, for Asian Americans in Hollywood right now. Um, that said, I think there's what's also really exciting is that there's also so much opportunity to do more, to do better, to fill in all the different gaps. And I'm including two movies right here. So Minari um, and Parasite, which I would say are two are probably the biggest Korean or Korean American films to be released in the last few years, um, because they are two movies that I think show you that there is such a range of stories to still tell. And I think especially one thing to keep in mind, especially when I think about how the Korean entertainment industry versus the Hollywood entertainment industry may differ, is I think one thing that we're still figuring out in, uh, in the States is how to differentiate between Asian versus Asian American stories. And what does that look like? And what does that say? And how do those differ? And I think that's something that um, I'm, I'm really excited to see what that difference looks like and how we continue to explore all those different narratives. Um, because I still think we're still at the very much the surface level of really unpacking all the nuances of those uh, stories. 
And so when I really think about it, I think I often think about this question in my own work when I'm writing uh, scripts and when I'm you know, trying to sell stories and when I'm working with my agent and my manager about what we think is going to attract the next buyer is because for me, it always comes back to writing a Asian American film. Oftentimes the characters that I'm writing into my scripts are of Korean descent, sometimes they're not. Uh, but either way, I think I always want to bring it back to writing stories that center Asian American stories and Asian American characters. And I think what we're finding right now is that we're still kind of discovering what that really means. Sometimes that might mean a first generation immigrant story like Minari. Sometimes that might mean just a story that doesn't even talk about the fact that anyone is Asian. Sometimes that might mean a, a big blockbuster like Shang-Chi, which gives nods to Asian culture and heritage and mysticism, but isn't there to talk about the culture all for the for two hours. And I think that's something where I think that's a, there's a great opportunity to tell a lot of stories that don't necessarily are aren't necessarily about Asian American culture, but use the specificity and the details and the, the nuance of what we go through in our day to day lives to bring a universal entertaining story to life that talks about universal truths like being a ambitious person, like being a dreamer, like being a hard worker, like being a fool, because those are all things that encapsulate who we are. And, and it's not just about being an Asian person in that, in that specific instance, but it's something that is about just being a human being. And I think that's something that starring John Cho was able to luckily tap into. And clearly uh, a lot of people were excited to kind of explore that and go deeper into that conversation. Because I think what, what it really means, and this is a tweet that I try to put out every May during Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, uh, is that we are still continuing to unpack this myth that there is this right way to be Asian American, that you are always going to be the hard worker, the competent one, the one who's always level-headed, the smartest, the most hardworking. And that simply isn't true. And as, 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 much, as, may, as much as we would all hate to admit it, we all have our flaws and our downfalls and the ways in which we have wronged other people, but all the, all the ways that we have loved other people and hoped and dreamt for them too. And I think that's something that we need to continue push against the moment someone says an Asian person is only this way, a Korean person can only be X, Y, Z, is that that simply isn't the case and that's okay. And that's and to embrace that is to just acknowledge that we have as many flaws and ambitions as anybody else. And that those are the stories that we shouldn't be trying to erase, but in fact, we should try to be embracing all those facets of who we are. And, and yet we can still take pride in the fact that we are Asian, we are Korean, we are still able to be this community together. And I think the more that we're able to do that, the more we're able to see, let other people see us for full rounded, well-rounded, interesting nuanced people and you're able to push against the stereotypes the assumptions the generalizations and i think those are the ways i think which storytelling can affect the way cultures and communities see us um, and look at us as less foreign or may look at us as less uh, as a stranger and see us more as a um, someone that they can relate to and they can find um, common strengths in so hopefully, I think, you know, with the way that starring John Cho has impacted the world to a certain extent, and, you know, the ways in which I'm trying to make my difference in the Hollywood space by writing stories that center Asian American stories, my hope is that hopefully in the near future, we see fewer movies that are just, you know, for that star for white guys named Chris, and maybe, you know, just maybe we might see more movies that star a guy named John. Um, and maybe that'll make Hollywood a little bit more interesting of a place uh, for years to come. And that's, yeah, that's my talk. That's my talk for today. Thank you so much for, for listening. Uh, again, if you ever want to talk about any things more and talk about Asian representation, talk about starring John Cho or about the, the journey of screenwriting, um, I am more than happy to, to continue chatting. And you can either follow me on Twitter where I am very, very active and would love to talk with you more at. Um, you can also connect with me on LinkedIn or, or just email me um, as well. But um, thank you so much for listening. And if, yeah, I would love to chat some more and hear any questions to discuss, you know, what, what, a, what a crazy time and exciting time and hopeful time this is for Asians and Asian Americans in, uh, in Hollywood. Wow, that's a great uh, presentation, William. Uh, a lot of things that kind of 
been in the back of my mind, but you really brought it out. I appreciate very much what you've had to say. Um, it is time for uh, Q&A, and some of you may know how to use the, um, the raise hand thing. Otherwise, just put a note in the chat box, and I'll try and get around to everybody. So, who has questions? Who has answers? I have a question. Um, we certainly wouldn't want a Japanese or a Chinese playing a Korean character, probably. I think in an, in an ideal, yeah. It's kind of I tongue in, in cheek. In, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think in an ideal world, in, in, a, in, in if everything was, was fair and right and equal in this world, I think we would, I would love to see you know, culturally accurate casting 100% of the time. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I think that would be, that would be great. Um, you know, I do, I do also think that the reality of, of an industry like Hollywood is that there are plenty of reasons and excuses for people not to do that. And also just the reality of there are only so many actors, so many roles. Um, and so oftentimes that doesn't, that doesn't always happen. Um, that said, I think, you know, to me, what I do think is important that when someone does take on the role that is outside of their culture or outside of their community, that they do their due diligence of taking it on as a responsibility and, do, and finding the nuance of that character and understanding where they're coming from culturally and where as an actor from a different culture where their gaps might be and hoping to try to bridge that as best as I can, best as they can. Does, does that mean it's gonna happen 100% of the time? Probably not, mm -hmm. but I would at least hope that there's that, that attempt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Elena, go ahead with your question. Uh, sure. Hi. Um, I'm going to be lecturing in, in two weeks, <laughs> actually. I'm going to talk about subtitling. So anyway, yeah, I mean, what you just said, I think we can't really restrict all this casting to, you know, you Korean American, you know, you play Korean only. And so like uh, someone said, you don't worry about that. Like Australian can play American or, you know, American playing British. So as long as, as you said, as long as they can bring the authenticity to the character, it shouldn't be restricted. And in, in the ideal world, it should be, you know, all colorblind casting and gender blind casting, as long as it doesn't require a specific gender, you know, because uh, like John Cho can playing Martian or, you know, James Bond, I mean, James Bond. So, um, yeah, and um, I think the most important thing is that, like you, you are a screenwriter, and there should be more people behind the cameras, because we only write about what we know. That's why, you know, that's one of the main reasons that there are no scripts that, you know, uh, portrays Asian Americans or uh, other than, like, you know, there are a lot of stories about white people, European Americans or Jewish people, they are European Americans too, originally, because you write, again, you, you can only write about what you know. And I remember uh, one of the older Asian American writer, Michael Chung, he wrote a, a story that has had nothing to do with uh, Asian American and ethnicity. It was a um, mm -hmm. thriller involving like eight people. Contact, I don't remember, it came out like 20, 25 years ago, you know, and he was very um, successful, but, and then he wasn't particularly talking about, so you shouldn't be, I think, as an actor, writer, director, should be re necessarily restricted by your ethnicity. So you can, you should be able to write anything as long as you know what to do with it. You are, you know, you have knowledgeable about it. So, but again, you know, but Again, people just don't want to, you know, you can just bring Asians or Asian Americans onto the screen when there's no story, right? Otherwise, they will just mm, a decorative sure. piece. So I think yeah. that's another thing that we have to increase representation on all sides, not just in, yeah. you know, a, a, any a specific area. So it's more, more like a comment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I no, remember I, John I, I, agree. I agree. Yeah, I mean, John Cho is a very gifted actor. I remember seeing him in his debut film called The Better Luck Tomorrow. Do you remember that? Like in mm -hmm. the yeah, early 1990s, awesome. he really stood out. There were other actors. So in the end, when you are talented, you get to, you know, of course, it, you have to have been the right place, right time, like um, Paul Newman said, very famously said. So you have to have talent, but you have to be lucky as well. So 
Yeah, I guess uh, the thing is, it, it, it has to be all on front. This effort kept needs to, you know, uh, continue, not in only in mm -hmm. acting or screenwriting, but everywhere else. And I think that that's why um, Parasite, the example of Parasite is really important because it's not talking about Korean ethnicity. Nobody talks about it, but it's a, really a human story, this widening gap between haves and have nots all over the world. So that's why everybody responded because it's a universal story. It doesn't matter who mm -hmm. talks, you know, like what they look like, as long as you can relate to their story. I think that's the lesson we need to remember in the end. All right, thank you. No, that, I mean, I think that's really well said and I 100% I, I agree. And I think, I think especially when we talk about representation in front and behind, I think it's also not just on the creative side as well, right? I think you need more executives, you need more mm -hmm. financiers, you need more investors mm -hmm. in, in, in this talent that are all coming from these different backgrounds who are going to be able to have top of mind, think about helping their community, trying to further these stories as well. I think like it's, it's definitely not a, there's one easy solution. I think it's intersects with all aspects of how the industry works. And I agree, like, I think one thing that, that uh, the more than uh, that as that increases and that there are more you know Asian kids in college who see a path as, a, as their future if there are more little kids who are given a camera and they're put in their hand and say hey go shoot something you know you hope that that that, that pipeline continues continues to grow um, I love the comment about parasite because I think that's always something that growing up one thing I started to notice that I would always get very jealous of anytime I would go to Korea and like watch a movie with my family, and you you know you're just, and you slowly start to realize that like oh i'm just watching people be people on these on these in these movies in these films and yet oftentimes when i would see a lot of asian american media growing up it always felt mm -hmm. like every character every story had to justify why they were there. Mm -hmm. They always had to be mm -hmm. like, why are you the Asian person on screen right now? Talk about your Asian thing on the Asian screen. Otherwise you really should just be another different kind of actor. And I think that was something that now, now that I have the ability to write my own stories and to you know, try and figure out how I wanna navigate this industry is almost taking that mindset of like, yeah, let me just tell stories about people being people. And mm -hmm. you know, if they are Korean, great. If they're not Korean, let's make sure we're, we're making them interesting in, some, in a different mm -hmm. way. And I do think that like, hopefully uh, what I love about Parasite is setting that example of saying, hey, you know, Koreans can be bad people too. Koreans oh, can yeah. be <laughs> swindlers. Koreans can be, you know, really out to get you. And as well as being people who want to save the day. And I think, you know, we, we need more of that breadth of experience shared with the entire world. Mm -hmm. I mean, Squid Game. I mean, I watched uh, three, first three episodes of Squid Game last night on a, on a screener, uh, on a SAG member. So I'm luckier than some of, most of you, you guys can have to watch it on streaming, but I have actually DVD. <laughs> I can watch it in time. So yes, the same story. I mean, it's set in Korea, but again, the, you know, people in financial ruins, and you can relate to that. So, you know, they had to go through, I mean, and I didn't know they were once released. I mean, I didn't know that it was, you know, so they voted to be released. Like we cannot be here after 255 were killed. Oh, oh I'm spoiling for some of you. And then, no, but no, then- yeah, don't do it. <laughs> oh, but then eventually they went back because they were, they were so desperate. And so, you know, that's, that's why I think Squid Game got so, I mean, it, it, it became a worldwide, uh, I mean, maybe Netflix saying it, maybe that's not true, I don't know. But again, the reason was, it was relatable story for people. It was not about this Asian person, this East Asian people doing something weird. So it's, um, yeah, it's, a, the, it's my uh, two cents, once again. Elena, thank you. I, uh, Elena briefly mentioned that she'll be our speaker on March 8th. Um, some of you may remember about a year ago, we had Martin Limon talking about his series of uh, novels set in the 70s, late 70s in uh, Korea with two American CID agents. Elena has been a, a consultant for Martin uh, for the Korean language elements of his stories and uh, it does a million other things. And I'll talk, I'll announce that lecture uh, later on. I wanna go to Amy. Uh, Amy, go ahead and unmute and ask your question, please.
Amy, we're not hearing you. Sorry, I had the wrong microphone selected. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah. I've, okay. And, and they're done that. Yeah. yeah sorry about that. <laughs> no um, it's sort of a question, also sort of a comment. Um, I'll admit I'm probably, mm, I've seen more hours of Korean drama than I've seen probably of my family <laughs> in certain times. So yeah, a big, big fan of, of watching things that are not network American television, uh, partly because it, the stories are boring, been there, done that. Every single Hallmark movie looks exactly the same and follows the exact same, uh, you know, storyline. <laughs> um, and so I want to say thank you very much for, for bringing more attention to the fact that um, movies here in the U.S. don't have representation because as someone who's raising children, <laughs> I want for them to see a world with representation for everyone. Um, and I just wanted to, to add that I think that it's an exciting time because if we look at the success of like say Bridgerton, which completely threw every single stereotype upside down, like, you know, the queen is black in England in Victorian times, really? But why not? Why not? So I, I think it's really an exciting time. And I think that, that American audiences are, want representation and don't want um, one-sided, very, you know, yeah, <laughs> whitewashed films. That, that, that's my thought. And I think that a lot of us turn to Netflix and turn to international films because we're not getting that in American films. We're seeing, you know, really bicultural shows um, in Australia, you know, where you see Indian families where they they'll use their their names for their grandmother and they'll use refer to the foods that they're eating and they refer to their cultural celebrations. And that's just part of the storyline because they're just living their life. It's not because it's about their culture. So I, I just wanted to thank you for for putting that out there and, and tell you that it's appreciated. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Amy. Anyone else? Hey, I don't have a, a raise hand thing, but there is somebody in the comments who has a question. Oh, I, okay, that just popped up. Uh, where is that Phaedra, oh. Phaedra's question? Oh, I'm sorry, it went it went past uh, Phaedra's question. Yes, I it, there were two or three comments that popped it up. Yes, can you see that, William? In your yep, I can. So says. Yeah. yeah, I'll just read it out loud. Yeah, so I'm quite happy these days after Crazy Rich Asians, BTF, 88, Rising, Parasite, and other project success in the States, in your opinion, what kind of strategy will maintain this trend? For example, uh, I always mispronounce this, Hybe, the entertainment company for BTS, merged with Ithaca Holdings, and it gave them not just the influence, but also the power to decide should other companies from Asia make similar strategy in film industry, or do you have other opinions? I mean, I think it, yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a great question, and I think it's something where, like, the business side of it. So, for example, like, a lot of times as a writer, um, right now, every time I uh, sometimes go out for opportunities, people will ask me like, oh, do you have like a K-pop script that you're writing? And, um, or like, what type of ways, like we really wanna get on this like K-pop trend, maybe we should write something. And sometimes I think you can feel like they're trying to follow, it's like a quick cash grab or it's a quick money grab. But at the same time, like, there are on the macro side of it, a lot of entertainment group like CJ, I think is also trying to come into the US a lot more and trying to adapt a lot more K-dramas also into American adaptation. So I think there will continue to be more of those kinds of joint ventures because I just think that the money of it probably makes too much sense. Um, and then I think also, I think for me, what's also really exciting is that like the, 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 the Korean influence seems to be on uh, on a snowball that just seems to be happening it doesn't seem to be going away so I have no doubt that that will continue at least for me as as an Asian and a Korean American writer I think just what I'm more excited is seeing weirder funner crazier ideas come from the Asian American community and I think that's something where um that is where like for example this the script that I'm working on right now which is called uh it was you it's a romantic comedy um and John and Chu, the director of Crazy Rich Asians, is attached to it as a producer, and I'm working with his production company to get it to a point where hopefully we can sell it to a studio. Um, and it's a romantic comedy, kind of in the vein of You've Got Mail, where these two, it's set in Manhattan, Chinatown, and these two young people who, one guy from the neighborhood and a woman, young woman who runs a big startup, um, 
are at it battling over the fate of Chinatown, but little do they know that they've matched on a new kind of dating app, which has like no bios and no profile pictures and they just get matched anonymously. And so they're falling in love on this application. You know, that hopefully to me is like a fun way to take a spin that we're familiar with and kind of do it in a different way. And I think that's what, what I'm excited for. And I think other writers that I know are also trying to do their versions of new kinds of storytelling. Um, so at least on the storytelling aspect, I think that's kind of where that will continue to grow. Um, and then I think either, I think finding more ways for big Korean companies to hopefully also invest in Asian American writers and creators. Um, that's, that's a big hope for me too, because I think that's something where you can potentially try and tap into individuals and creatives who kind of live on that in-between gap. And I think that's something where not a lot of people have that skill set, and I think that's something where it is quite rare for Asian American. That is a unique perspective that Asian American uh, creatives uh, have. Great. Um, can I ask one question? I mean, maybe uh, you remember um, All American Family, you know, starring it was called All Americans. Uh, All American uh, Margaret Girl. Cho. Margaret Cho? All American yeah. Girl, yeah, some years ago. And mm -hmm. um, there was a, a backlash saying that why, you know, it was from Korean American community uh, saying that mm -hmm. why did you cast Chinese actor, actress for, to play a Korean mom? And why is this Margaret Cho, you know, is she, why is she so fat? <laughs> Something like that. So she had to lose weight in two weeks, which eventually led to her kidney failure, things like that. So um, often, you know, your own family, you think your own, you know, if you think that this is your community, but they can be even harsher than the, you know, the outside community. So, and um, so in, in relation to earlier, you know, a comment about like, is it okay for Japanese or Chinese playing Korean character or vice versa? So, and, uh, you know, you can satisfy everybody. So there will be some backlash always. So I think um, to make the Asian Americans uh, representation on both sides much more, made, you know, in, in brought into the mainstream, make it more, um, you know, uh, ac acceptable. I think the backlash has to be skillfully managed. Meaning, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, every public bad publicity is a good pub. Every publicity is a good pub publicity, right? That's what they say. So it'll it'll generate buzz and all that, but it shouldn't kill the goods, uh, you know, the golden goose. So I think that has to be also uh, in the dis in the discussion among you know not only creating you know materials and employing actors and all the creative crew, but you know what if it's not that's not accepted and then people start saying that it's not accurate, that not correct. We don't like it. So it, you know, and so that should be part of the conversation so that we can all grow. I mean, mainstream audience does the same thing, but it doesn't kill the mainstream movie. You know, it continues. But uh, judging from the history of the Asian American representation in, in entertainment industry, I think that uh, has to be, you know, uh, kept in mind going forward, I think. I agree. I, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the, the way that I, I kind of view it, and I think this is also why we are living in such a unique time for the culture right now, where I think one thing that, interestingly enough, that I feel like the, the community and creators need and want are more opportunities to fail and more opportunities to try and shoot their shot and understand that their mistakes will be made. And that's okay. And that not every project has to be the best project. And I think All American Girl is a very interesting example in which I think so many aspects of that production was so flawed from a casting point of view, from the fact that most of the writers room were non-Asian, most of their like leadership team was non-Asian. It was also during a time that was also much more sexist and more racist than what we're currently living in. So it had a very high bar that it needed to clear as well as also being so unprecedented that it basically had to be like you are either the pinnacle of of tv art or you're nothing and i think unfortunately it went the, the latter way and so i think what we're finding now which is great which i think is really encouraging is that people are getting more chances to put out different things and not everything is gonna hit but i think and i think that's also paired with the fact that audiences are realizing that this one movie cannot 
and will not encapsulate everything about who I am and what my culture is. And the fact that I am expecting it to is a bit unfair. The fact that I should watch Crazy Rich Asians as a Korean person and think that if this movie doesn't encapsulate my entire ability and my entire being as a Korean American, then it's a bad movie. I think we kind of can understand a little bit now that that's not necessarily a fair expectation to have. And I think that's something that hopefully that, that as that mindset continues and grows, we give ourselves more room to understand that the only way that we're gonna get to that point where we feel so seen by something is to create more and to generate more and to make mistakes and to learn from it. And I think right now we're finding hopefully that to be more true than ever. Great. John, did you uh, uh, have a comment? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, I wanted to point out something. You kind of jogged my memory, Steve, when you were talking about like other ethnicities shouldn't play Korean characters. <clears throat> Fred Armisen is uh, a comedian uh, who's been on like all sorts of things, but uh, he was originally saying that he was like, he's mixed race and he was saying he was part Japanese. And a few years ago he discovered, oh, actually because of Japanese war history, I'm part Korean. So yeah, it's, it can be a little, you know, mixed up sometimes, mm -hmm. but um <clears throat> My one of my main reactions to all the posters in the John Cho thing is like sometimes you swap in uh, John Cho in a romance movie and it pairs him with a white woman or something. Uh, and I, I think I, I haven't heard much discussion about that because it does seem to be a pretty visible thing that hasn't really been commented on from what I've seen. Like um, Hollywood doesn't seem too creative when it comes to mixed race couples and romance and things like that. So I'm curious, uh, like, how you feel that's been addressed or hasn't been addressed or why it hasn't. Like, uh, I'm sure it actually maybe even has the potential to upset Asian audiences in some cases, I don't know. So I'm curious about that. And I also wanted to throw out another name for you to hear your comment on it. I'm Canadian and I wanna know what you think of Kim's Convenience. Sure. Um, I mean, as far as the, the interracial like relationship stuff in it, I think, I mean, I think what's interesting is that oftentimes, I think, especially Asian men very rarely get to have a romantic interest at all in films, you know, I think most many, many times in the ways in which Asian men are often represented on screen are either, either as like emasculated nobodies or tech wizards or kung fu sidekicks and never quite someone who gets the girl or who is able to kind of like woo woo the romantic lead. Um, so I think that that already you're, you're, you're starting at kind of a, a, a behind the curve in terms of like what the types of relationships that media has said you are allowed to be involved in or not. Um, you know, I think my hope is that in the, the main goal of, I think, starring John Cho and this entire movement and where I hope the culture goes is that to show that we are multifaceted people who are involved in all parts of life. I think a big part of that is also showing the fact that Asian men and Asian women have partners from a wide range of ethnicities and genders and sexualities. And so I think to me, the hope is that that continues to grow and it gets more normalized uh, over the course uh, of, of time. I think, you know, knowing Hollywood, if I'm real, like knowing Hollywood, they're probably gonna pick a certain kind of romantic lead for films because that to them is also what sells or what does well. And so I have no doubt that that also will take a certain attitude or, or in terms of what people are getting used to seeing. But I think, you know, I think one of, one of the most iconic interracial relationships is like Jet Li and, and Aaliyah from Romeo Must Die, which is an Asian man and a black woman. And I think that is something that like, yeah, I think we can all agree does exist in our lives, is something that is beautiful, is something that can exist more. And I think where we do find oftentimes a lot of that conversation of people that are for or against it can also sometimes when you think about a movie going international and then you also all of a sudden have to abide by certain international cultural norms as well. And so it'll be interesting to see. I, I think for me, like, I, I am pro more is more. And so I think I'm very much, the more we can show the nuances and give heart to all those types of relationships, I can only imagine that it brings us all closer together as, as people. And so my hope is that, yeah, those all get continued and, and are given the level of, of thoughtfulness that I think any heteronormative, similarly gendered or ethnicity relationship is depicted. Um, because why not? Why not? Why not at this point? 
Uh, as far as Convenient goes, uh, I, know, I haven't seen the whole thing of Kim's Convenience. I've seen a few episodes of Kim's Convenience. And um, I think I love the fact that there is a heartwarming family sitcom um, that is rooted in a specific culture. And I think that's something that uh, when, when now that it, 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 it wrapped and then, uh, or even like fresh off the boat, like I think those are types of shows that also the, it, to me solidifies that there is such a wide range of stories to be told. Not everything doesn't have to be art house, Oscar winning, you know, like fancy schmancy, beautiful cinematography shots. You can have great broad comedies that can hit a, a, a wide range of people and have that just have, and also just, and have people connect with the, the, the weirdness of your family because we all have those weird, weird family members. And so um, I love a show like, like a show like Kim's Convenience can exist and can find life and can find it audiences uh, around the world. I, I just want to add very quickly. Uh, one of the one of the problems with Kim's Convenience, there was a lot of backlash to it recently. Was apparently it's it's largely created by white people, um, and the actors are very underpaid considering you know their their high profile. So yeah, if if you get a chance, I, I recommend looking into it. One really weird yeah. thing, uh, a difference between Canada and America is like, you guys have about maybe seven percent Asian Americans. In Canada, it's like 17.7%. So like, it's almost one in five people. So yeah, uh, it's, uh, I, I was shocked when I discovered that actually. I, I usually don't think that we're too different, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's a huge right. difference. That's huge. I mean, I, I and I think, sorry, just speak to the, the that part of, of like how Kim's Communities is created. I think that is something that like you hope and you pray that like they're doing their due diligence. And I think it was very clear that there were like uncomfortable moments on set, uncomfortable moments between the showrunner and the staff writers and the people that were performing. And I think that that is 100% not ideal, disappointing to hear. And I think every, every writer and creative of color in that instance has absolute right to call that out and say, this is not what I signed up for. And this is not what I feel is best for my performance or my ability to tell the story. Um, I think that's how I feel about that part of it. Uh, but as far as like the idea of a show like that existing, I think that's, I, I, I'm, I'm glad that a show like Kim's Convenience exists. Um, do I wish that it could have been conducted in a, in a way that I think deserved to be conducted for the people that were involved? 100%. Great. Well, thank you again, William, for uh, sharing with us today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, our Literature Club will be meeting on March 3rd, uh, Thursday, March 3rd, 7.30 p.m. Uh, and uh, the Colloquium in Korean Studies is next week, Thursday, February 24th, 6 p.m. by Zoom. Uh, archaeologist uh, Professor Kang Bong Wan is going to talk about the Bangude petroglyphs, which are kind of southeast of Gyeongju uh, in uh, Korea here. Uh, he argues that they date not from the Bronze Age, but from the Neolithic Age, which pushes the dating of those uh, petroglyphs back almost 3,000 years from what archaeologists have thought to the current time. Um, we have a new partnership that's in progress with the Yonsei University Underwood International College, uh, and uh, we'll be uh, sharing the next lecture with that organization on March 23rd. Uh, so it's, it's still some time off, but uh, Thomas Quartermain, who's an associate professor at Yonsei, will be talking about the debates of patriotism during the Imjin War, the 1500s invasions from Japan. Uh, we'll, I've, I've put a link on the uh, chat box. You can check the RES website for that too. Um, our next lecture uh, in our regular RES series will be on March 8th, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we'll be joined by Elena Chang, who will talk about translating Hollywood, the limits of localization. What issues occur when English language film is translated into Korean? We're talking subtitles and dubbings and that kind of thing. Uh, what happens linguistically and culturally? Uh, English and Korean share little common ground. Uh, so there's some nuanced localization that's critical. 
sometimes the subtitles and dubbings get it, and a lot of times they don't. Uh, so uh, Elena is, uh, uh, she's an FBI qualified translator as well as classically trained with MFA uh, credentials. Uh, and uh, she's uh, been the last uh, many years, oh, oh, wait a minute, you also have a degree in law from SNU, that's right. Uh, <laughs> so Elena, knows her stuff. Uh, so we're really looking forward to hearing more about uh, translation, localization, consecutive interpreting, uh, those kinds of things when, we, uh, when we're dealing with media, films especially. Uh, so I hope that we will see you all then. Uh, check our website, check our YouTube channel, uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you on March 8th back at our regular time and date. Sorry, Elena. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I know. She's, she's, it's gonna be 2.30 a.m. my time. I mean, 2 a.m. my time. Late. You're gonna stay up late rather than go to bed and get up early, right? Yes, I will, <laughs> for all of you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you all. William, again, thank you. And thank you, William. Thank you. Have a good Friday thank night so in the much. U.S. Have a good Saturday afternoon Thanks. here in Korea or wherever else you are. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Right. Bye.